thanks to you today. We're going to read this psalm. Um, if I get any of this wrong, uh, Wal will correct me later. Uh, Wal, Wal's been doing some great background stuff for us uh, on this psalm. And it's just, it's just very interesting that in the time of the Jew, right before the Jewish New Year, which is called E-L-U-L, Elul, right before, was it Wal, Rosh, Hash, Rosh Hashanah, right before the Jewish New Year, they'd read Psalm 27, morning and night. And they read it out of a sense of, of joy. It was leading up to repentance, but repentance wasn't. Repentance was to lead to joy. That's why you'll find in the book of Isaiah, it says, spring up, oh well. Therefore, with joy will we draw waters out of the wells of salvation. There was a springing up. So leading right up to the Jewish New Year, right through Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, they would read this psalm morning and night. And today I'm only going to take the first two verses. But this is a psalm of David. And so it's just such an interesting psalm. So let's, um, let's just read it all together. As a church, we're reading from the New King James Version. Again, we're not just reading words on a screen. We're actually reading God's word to us this morning. And there's something very, very important from not just reading, but speaking aloud the word of God. We're declaring it out into the principalities and powers into the air. We're declaring it to ourselves this morning. So let's join with David as we read this psalm this morning. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came up against me to eat my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise up against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will see. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord. and Lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen up against me and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Lord, as we've just read your word, open up our hearts, open up our understanding. All of us are in different places here this morning. Speak afresh to us, O God. Speak afresh, O Lord. May, Lord, as we open your word, we have a fresh encounter with you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. David's in the midst of life's difficulties. He's in the midst of trials and tests. He said his enemies are coming against him. He says he's been forsaken. He says he he faces fear. But in facing fear, he makes a prophetic declaration. He declares his faith in the Lord. And you'll notice in that scripture that it's not capital L-O-R-D. It's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Talking about he is the covenant Lord. He's made a covenant with us. And he faces fear. A life with his declaration in his heart and with his mouth. I love verse 13. He says, I would have lost heart 
unless I had believed, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. There's a verse that you can take in the midst of your week when things are going wrong and you can stand there going, I believe over my family, over my children, over my grandchildren, over my descendants, I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord now. Yes. Not, not when I get to heaven, now in the land of the living. Right. Have you lost heart this morning? It's not a sin to have lost heart. You just we're reminded in the New Testament not to because it means we can. Because things come in. It happens in our journey from salvation to heaven. David this morning comes to encourage us, even though at times our faith may seem little, even though at times we feel like we may have even lost faith, lost heart, David comes to encourage us this, that God is in control. Because if God's not in control, we're all in big trouble. The government, it's not like the government's in control or this is in control or the enemy's in control or this person's in control. God is in control. He sits on his throne and he's not troubled by the things that trouble us or go on. He has everything under control. And so David here declares the Lord is in control. What are you facing today that you need to declare that the Lord is in control? You know that when I was in hospital, I was on approximately, after my operation, to replace the valve and replace the artery and then fix up something else that they uh, messed up whilst in hospital. I was on 24 medications. I was on 24 tablets a day. Uh, thank goodness I'm now down to four. Because after, after a while, when you have to swallow 24, or some of you here will have to swallow a lot of tablets, it, ta- it makes it very hard. But with these medications... And with the staff and the doctors, they were all hoping in my recovery. Not to take them would have been foolish, would have been detrimental to my physical health. But more important than my medication, church, more important than even the pills that you may be taking or the vitamins you may be taking that may be good for you, this book, written by different authors, inspired by the Holy Spirit, written over different periods, all point to Jesus. These scriptures, listen, are spiritual medicine for my soul. (laughs) These scriptures are spiritual medicine for my soul. And the same with my tablets, not to take them. It's foolish for me, detrimental to my spiritual walk. If that stay shut, that I don't open it, that I don't read it, that I don't allow God to speak to me through the scriptures. David here, to, this, this psalm's written somewhere 900 something BC, 3,000 years ago. And yet David today is mentoring you and I. But if I don't open up, if I don't read it, I don't have any spiritual medicine for my soul. We're just saying in that verse, I say to my soul, the Lord is in control. And so I need my physical medication. But I need my spiritual medicine to speak to me, to encourage me, to remind me that God is in control. And I need his strength to go from here to tomorrow to next week. In the things that I face, my strength is only found in Christ alone and in the word of God and what he says to me. What David writes to us today, I just love it from the scriptures, is just as real to us today as 3,000 years ago when he penned it. Probably not even knowing that you and I would be reading it, would be receiving it. Yeah, there's many, um, some of these, in the last couple of weeks, there's different characters in the Bible that as I've just been looking at them and reminding myself of them, some of them are like Sunday school stories to us. But they remind us, they talk to us, that God is in control. A long time before David, matter of fact, way up the beginning of your Bible, it's hard to even squeeze him in, is Job. And Job lost everything. But Job stands up in the midst of everything going wrong and he says, you know what, I know my Redeemer lives. And one day I will see him. And Job goes, I'm overwhelmed at the thought. I'm thinking, wow. 
Jesus has been for us. We've seen what Jesus has done for us. Job's way up in the beginning. He, and he makes a statement in the midst of everything going wrong. God, you're in control and I know that my Redeemer lives. And one day I will see him. I'm overwhelmed at the thought. He, Job says, he will do all he has planned for me. He controls my destiny as I follow him, as I yield to him. David, uh, Job would even go on and use a verse in a sense. He says, if God would slay me, we know God doesn't slay us. Matter of fact, God gave his life for us and God came to bring us back to him. But, but Job's saying, even if he could, yet I would still trust him. Why? Because my hope is in him, because God is in control. Uh, Grant, Pastor Grant last week, referred to the three uh, Hebrew boys. And why he referred to that, because I've been reading a book from Pastor Chris Hodges called The Daniel Dilemma. How do we live in our world today as the three Hebrew boys and Daniel did in their day and still be full of hope and still be full of wisdom and follow God? They were asked to bow down to, their names were Hananiah, Shadrach. Their Hebrew names were Michelle, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego were the Babylonian names that they'd given them. And they were asked to bow down to a golden image. Not only were they asked to bow down, when they heard the sound of the musical instruments, they were to bow down. There's a sound that goes on in our world today, Lord, folks. Not even just music. There's a sound that goes on once you and I to bow down to something else that's gone. And it's very interesting that uh, there was, when the music played, they were to bow down. It's interesting, though, that they didn't li- when, they were t- when they were told they had to bow down, the three Hebrew boys, they didn't go out and lead a rebellion. They didn't plan a boycott. They didn't stage a protest rally. They didn't post their protest on Facebook to see how many, how many likes they could get or on YouTube or Twitter. They didn't even condemn the king for his law. What a stupid law. Because oftentimes we're qu- very quick to speak out when a politician, oh, that's stupid or that's stupid. They didn't even condemn the king. They didn't even go to court to argue their case on why they didn't need to bow down. They actually said, we don't even have to defend ourselves in this matter. They simply said, we will not bow down. Why? Because our God is in control and we trust God to rescue us. But even if he doesn't, we will not serve your gods for we will worship him only. Why? Because God is in control of our lives. And that's why I say that, church, is because things happen to us. Things in your world, things in my world that rock us. And we start to wonder, where is God? But God is still in control. He's just asking us to trust him. He sees the whole bigger picture. Why we only see this. What about Daniel? They tried to get him to worship something else other than God. And they issued a decree that he could not pray to God. What does he do? He prays openly to God three times a day. He didn't panic like the three Hebrew boys. He didn't argue about the unfairness of the decree. He just continued to pray and worship as usual. Even in the face of hungry lions, he knew that God was in control. Not the king, not the people, his enemies are against him, not the lions. God is in control of my life and I follow him. I've been created for him. David here in this psalm, is in the face of tribulation. He says he's, he's under attack from his enemies. He's under false accusations. He's been forsaken. He's facing fear and he will encourage us. God is in control. So David says, therefore, I can trust him. I have confidence in him. I don't have to fear. I don't have to worry. I don't have to be discouraged. I can declare who God is because David's strength was found in God alone. And so you will notice at the... well. If you, when you open up your scriptures, you will notice that he makes a prophetic statement. But above this psalm is written an exuberant declaration of faith. Are you able to bring up that very first screen for me? Thanks, Sarah. Right? Oh, I may not have put. I may not have included in my. I may not have included in my notes from the put in. But above, if you open up Psalm 27, your Bible, it makes this statement: an exuberant declaration of faith. Verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I, shall I be afraid? David is making this statement, not at a conference, not even at a Sunday service. 
But in the midst of facing danger, trouble, anxiety, in the midst of darkness, in the midst of the dark issues of his life that no one else can see, he'll make three declarations. He is my light. He is my salvation. He is the strength of my life. And he's making it the covenant Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. We now sit this side of the cross. We know it's Jesus, our saviour, our redeemer, our Lord. David's saying, he is the light in the midst of my darkness. Because we walk through dark periods of our life. But David says, even in the darkness, because I, 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 I may not be able to see even beyond tomorrow you may not even be able to see beyond today he goes he is my light in the midst of my darkness and his light enables me not only to face the darkness his light enables me to walk through the darkness without the darkness overwhelming me without the darkness overwhelming me there's a verse I'm, I'm going to try and pull out of the back of my head so I'll probably get it wrong but um I think it's Micah. And he talks about how the enemy says, it's like the enemies, I've got a hold of you. But Micah writes, even though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light unto me. So even times I, I choose the wrong way and I walk in darkness, and I bring my heart back to him, or you're in the midst of darkness surrounding about. Micah says, you tried to trip me up, O oh enemy, but when I, when I sit in darkness and I walk through darkness, the Lord himself will be a light unto me. He is saying, listen, the Lord is my light. We go, what's that? David's declaring it in the midst of darkness. The Lord's the light. He's going to enlighten my path. He's going to show me where to walk and how to walk and how to go through. And then he goes, he is my salvation. But not only, not only eternal salvation, David's saying, he's able to deliver me from whatever comes against me and from whatever threatens me. He is my salvation. He is able to save me. He's able to deliver me. When I cannot save myself, when I cannot deliver myself, you know what it's like when you come up with situations, it's either a massive pit or it's a dead wall right in your face. And you're going, Lord, you're my salvation. He's able to deliver me. He's able to bring deliverance into your family, into your children. Don't allow the enemy just to overwhelm you. David's going, declare it, the Lord is my salvation. He's able to deliver me. When the things that threaten against me, then he goes, he is the strength of my life. It means he's my stronghold. He's my refuge. He's my place of protection, the word means. It means that he actually elevates me when things are going. He actually elevates me to a greater height. He lifts me up above what is happening around about me. David says, he shows himself strong on my behalf. Not that I am strong, but he is strong. And without going into what Pastor Matthew uh, will share next week, David, David is not in self-confidence mode. He's in God-confidence mode. It's easy for us, church, to live in self-confidence mode because we feel like at times we've got to make it happen. We've got to have it all together. We've got to figure this thing out. But I don't know, I don't know about you, but there's things that I, I face and I struggle with that I cannot work out. And what happens is that these very you know what these situations do? They sap the life out of us. And David's going, these, these things that I'm facing that are sapping the life out of me, I declare that he is the strength of my life. It's important, as David probably wrote and sung this out, it's the importance of not just believing, but singing it out, but speaking it out by declaring it. David's going, whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid or dread? Fear is real. David was not trembling or startled by those coming against him. He was in fear actually of the God who was in control. He stood amazed at who he was. He, you're my light. You're my salvation. You're my strength. I don't know what you're facing today or even what you've walked through or what even as a church we have walked through. Sometimes things that come against us, 
they, they, they're real. The fear is real. But in the midst of it, David says, listen, if you're my light, you're so my salvation, you're my strength. Whom shall I fear? What will I come against? Because God, you are over all. You are in control of all. Even though five years ago, I was probably surprised looking at how fit I am not that my valve would be blocked. I was caught by surprise, but you know what? God was not. Even before I was born, God thought, you know, at 61, you're going to need a new, you're going to need a new valve. Just keep putting your trust in me. Just keep following me. Just keep. Because God, you are greater than any need I have. You are greater than anything happens to me. You are greater. You are in control. Verse 2, David says, when the wicked, and, I, and I've added some words here from other versions, when the wicked or the evildoer came, came against me to eat my flesh, it just means to consume me or destroy me. Not even necessarily people, although there is an enemy that does come against us to consume us, to destroy us, but even things in life come against us and just try to consume us and destroy us. David says, when the wicked evildoer came against me to eat my flesh, to consume me and destroy me, my enemies that oppose you or are in hostility against you. And my foes just means an adversary. We have an adversary. His name's the devil. They stumbled, they were brought down and fell. They no longer had control of my life or situation. We have an adversary. We have an enemy that's against us. We have an accuser. Peter says he goes around like a roaring lion. Not a roaring lion, but as a roaring lion to try and devour us, to scare us, to threaten us. But he says, but if you submit to God, if you honour God, if you bring your life under his control, you're able to stand up and you're able to resist him. You're able to push him back. See, the enemy is not in control too. He may rule the prince and powers out, but he's not in control of you. He's not in control of my life. He's not in control of this church. We are under the lordship of God. We are under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. Ephesians tells us there is an enemy. And so he, we, we spoke on it last year. We're to put on the armor of God. One of the weapons we, we are to use to push back the enemy is the word of God. It's like a short dagger. And so when we come in coast conflict, I don't try and fight the enemy in my own strength. I don't try and fight him in my own opinions. We all have opinions on what should be have. I have to fight him. I come against him. What does the word of God say? I bring the word of God in the situation. The Lord is the light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Who shall I be afraid? Revelation says that they overcome him by the blood of the lamb, by the blood of Jesus and the word of their testimony. John goes further to say this. Listen. 1 John 4, 4, I think. John goes, hey, there's things coming in this world to overcome us. But greater is Jesus Christ in you than he that is in the world. When you go to your office tomorrow, Grant, when, when things appear hard to face, greater is Jesus Christ in you than any spirit that's in that office. When we leave here today, it's not that we go out like, but we go out knowing no matter what comes against us, no matter what happens, greater is Jesus Christ in me than he that is in the world. Because if it's not, then, who, then who's in control? But God's in control. David's making a declaration. God is stronger. God is more powerful. God is in control. He's the strength of my life and my strength is found in him. And so David makes a declaration of faith faith in his God. It's easy to make a declaration when everything's going fantastic. It's harder to make a declaration when you feel like everything's against you. David makes a, a declaration of faith. You can see it in that psalm. You know what? There's adversaries. There's enemies. I've been forsaken. My foe's trying to get me. There's an adversary coming against me. But I stand up in the middle. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is the strength of my life. Oswald Chambers says that faith is deliberate, deliberate confidence in the character of God whose ways you may not understand 
at the time. Let me read that again. Faith is the deliberate confidence in the character of God whose ways you may not understand at the time. Some of the situations that we have faced as a church over many years, especially over the past several months, sometimes it is hard to understand. And we don't fully understand. But what we do understand is that he is God and that he is good and that he is in control even when I don't understand. So because he's in control, he calls us to trust him. No different than Job or Daniel, the three Hebrew children or David. But it's not easy. Because over here, we give our heart and life to Christ. We're on a different different journey. We're now following him. Our destiny is to be with our Father forever, eternal life. So over here is heaven. And sometimes things are going, sorry, Mr. Cameraman, sometimes things are going good or not going so good. And I'm, I'm trying to trust him. God, you are good. God, you are faithful. God, you are in control. And then all of a sudden, whack, from left field comes something we're not expecting. Or bang, from right field, something we're not expecting. Disappointment, trouble, even tragedy is broken. Sickness, things we don't understand. Dark valleys, things that cause us to wrestle with heartaches, with loss, with disappointment with doubt, with painful emotions, with unanswered prayers. I guarantee we could fill a box here today with unanswered prayers. And yet all the time he's asking us on this journey through everything we walk through, just keep your eyes on me. I am in control. And that's the hardest part. I'm trying to trust you. That's why we need one another to encourage us. Hebrews 12, when he tells about to shake off the very things. We've got a cloud of witness watching us shake off different things that weigh you down from not walking. It says, keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. It says, keep your minds on Jesus. And then it's, and I think it's verse three or somewhere after we do that, it says, consider Jesus. It says, consider Jesus. It means to think about very carefully and very thoroughly on this war. When everything else is going wrong and I'm trying to, I'm trying to believe God you're in control, he says to fix your heart, fix your mind, fix your focus on Jesus. Consider Jesus so that in the midst of life, so that you don't become weary and end up giving up. And all of us have, have, um, all of us have that chance. It says, so you don't become weary. That's what it says. So you don't become weary and you don't become discouraged in your souls. Discouragement and disappointment. We all face and we'll go through. But we can't live there and we can't allow them to take up life within us because they will destroy our souls. They will take our focus off him and then we will go, and go well, God, you're not in control, so I have to be in control. Well, the enemy's in control or that's in control and we've lost sight. It says, in the midst of um, the cloud of witnesses, when you're running this race and you drop off sin and drop off the weights that are easily entangled, it says, consider Jesus, what he went through, everything he went through for you, consider very carefully Jesus so that in the midst of life, you don't become weary and discouraged in your soul. So we encourage one another, as David did. Lord, I have to rely on my focus. In the midst of my darkness, you are my light. In the midst of, I just need to be rescued, delivered, you are my salvation. In the midst, you are the strength of my life. Your words are spiritual medicine for my soul. I don't know how you felt, because I've already read this psalm numerous times this week. We used to sing it. So you can nearly sing half the psalm without even, you've got to change a few choruses because there's different different music for each one. 
I don't know how you felt when we were reading that this morning. Did that bring encouragement to your soul? Medicine to your soul? The Lord's my light. He's my salvation. I'm keeping you at the center. Lately, as a musician, you could come this morning. Very hard to scroll the computer screen when your fingers are like sweaty and... In the last couple of months, I've been praying the name of Jesus over people, over myself, over families, over our church, declaring that he is great, your name is great. See, that's what David did. The Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the covenant Lord, we now know as Jesus. We declare your name. We declare your great. Come up, guys. So I've been praying the name of Jesus. Situation. Not as a magic formula, but because he told us to use and to pray his name. Because his name is powerful. His name's above every other name. Jesus said in John 14, whatever you ask in my name, believing that I will do so, my Father will be glorified. Jesus said, if two of you agree, In my name, touching anything, my Father will be glorified. Matthew 16 says, and in my name, you will. And he talks about heal the sick, cast out demons. You will, in my name. Not like a magic formula, but he's saying, I'm giving you my name to use in your prayer. Especially over your family, especially over your life, especially over your children. Especially over your grandchildren. Philippians says that because Jesus humbled himself and went to the cross. Became a servant. He, and he said, died a hideous criminal death, even death on a cross for you and I. It says God has, has exalted him, has given him a name that's above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, everyone will bow. I don't want to get off the subject here, but one of the verses that I'll be sharing with different people at coffee that are not Christians. When we see ISIS growing up, and we see this movement coming up, and we see this coming up, and we see that coming up. It says we see the kings of the earth rallying against God. We want to bring this down. We don't want God here. We don't want God in parliament. We don't want God in schools. You know, in Psalm 2, that's exactly what happened. It said the kings of the earth got together and they plotted as if we're going to do this. And you know what the psalmist says? The one who sits in heaven laughs not laughs at them he laughs you know why because God is in control no matter what happens in our world today we're just called to be light in the middle of darkness we're called to be salt in an unflavoured world the rest of it's up to God we're just following you every chance I get especially coffee we bring the name of Jesus we bring Jesus to people because his name is greater more powerful God has given him a name that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. There is nothing more powerful than praying the Word of God and praying the name of Jesus. And I think somewhere along the line, church, we've let that go. I encourage you to start using his name. There is no devil. There is no attack of the enemy. There is no demonic power. There is no government. There is no situation. There is no trial greater than our God or greater than Jesus Christ. Nothing. Nothing is greater than He who has been exalted to the high place. Jesus Christ. He's the one we follow. He's the one we yield our life to. If our life ends tomorrow, what does it, what does it matter? Because we go to be with Him as long as on this journey we're taking others with us. That's what matters. That's what matters. That's what you and I will give an account for, church. We won't, we, he won't come to judge us and off to hell. He'll come He'll come as a judge to say, what have you done with your life? What have you done with the giftings I've given you? And how many people have you brought with you to Jesus? Because that's what I left you here to do. Don't worry about the rest of it. 
God is in control. Yes, we pray. Yes, we fast. Yes, we pray in the Holy Spirit. Yes, we put on the armor of God. Yes, there is an enemy. There's an adversary. Yes, we push him back. But he's not in control. God is. Jesus. And in the midst of fear, in the midst of darkness, in the midst of needing deliverance, in the midst of having no strength at all, David says, the Lord is my light. Let's stand this morning. The Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life.